Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall, curator of this curious collection of the mysterious and the macabre. We are told that the Lord created man in his own image. Therefore, it must follow that each of us is an image of the Lord. And since we are so various, so different in shape and size and color, you would think it presumptuous for any one person to say, Behold, what I look like is the only true image of the Lord. And yet, so many people do that very thing. Who is that man, Ben? Him? Oh, he's just one of my slaves, my houseboys. What a remarkable person. Remarkable? How? Just an ordinary, no account, shiftless. Oh, no, don't, don't say that. Well, but it's true. I see a grandeur, a nobility. Ah, you northern abolitionists. You keep seeing things that simply do not exist. I tell you, that young man will move mountains. Hey, Bob, you sure you ain't sick? It's all that boy can do to move his own two feet. He will move mountains. That that slave of yours has the power inside of him. The awful power. Ben, I can sense these things. <laughs> mystery drama, The Black Whale, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Brock Peters. All men are created equal. However, some people have always considered themselves more equal than others. When our great republic was founded, there were some people who weren't even considered people. It had to do with the color of the skin. If yours was white, you were people. If your skin was black, you were a slave. You were nobody. Actually, a black person wasn't even considered a person, except for the purposes of government record-keeping. And since the state was represented in Congress according to population, a slave was listed as three-fifths of a person. The year is 1820. We are in what is destined one day to become the state of Texas. Colonel Benjamin Borders, a wealthy farmer, is entertaining an old friend from the East. There is another person, or uh, we should say a non-person, in the room. His name is Jim. He is one of the house slaves. And this is to be his own story. All about me, the conversation swirled and eddied. Mr. Robert Darcy was not one of the Colonel's usual visitors. He was a man of learning and great education. How I envied him. And I stood there listening. Listening because that man spoke of such fantastic things. The power of the mind, Ben. The power of the mind can move mountains. Oh, really? I'd settle for a more simple kind of proof. I'd like to see somebody's mind make that wine bottle lift itself up and pour its contents into my glass. Under proper conditions, the right kind of mind could do it. <laughs> and speaking of wine, your glass is empty. Jim. Jim. Uh, yes, sir. You won't gather in again, boy. Uh, uh, no, sir. But weren't you trained? You know better than to leave a man's glass stand on till before him. Yes, sir. Well, pour the wines. Mr. Darcy to die of a thirst in my house. Oh, uh, Ben, I, I see you've been reading the books I sent you. Oh, well, uh, uh, no, Bob, I'm sorry to say I, <laughs> I ain't had a chance. Somebody must have been reading the books. The pages are cut. Well, nobody could read them, Bob. There's just me and the slaves in the house here. Well, do, do any of your slaves read? <laughs> you ain't serious, Bob. You can't be serious. How could a slave read? If he were taught, he could learn just like anyone else. Up in New York, Boston, I've met freed slaves who could read and write. Well, yeah, yeah, but it was a trick. A trick? Oh, you could teach a parrot to talk, can't you? It's all a trick. The young man who waited on us. Oh, Jim? He appears to be extremely intelligent. <laughs> well, that shows you. He's the dumbest one of all. There's a boy who just can't do nothing. His mind seems to be on something else. He's in another world, Ben. A world of his imagination. Uh, pure and simple wool gathering. No, no, no. I, I, I sense something else. There you do? <laughs> what? Power. 
power. The power to move mountains. <laughs> you all right, Bob. Poor boy, he's like a whale. A whale? Now, how do whales ever get into this? There are those who claim the whale is the most intelligent living creature on Earth. <laughs> you don't care who you call intelligent, do you, Bob? First blacks, and now whales. But you see, the, the whale is the captive of his physiology and his environment. He has no way to express his intelligence. He has no hands. He can't build. He can't live on land. He's a prisoner of the water. Uh, you're getting too deep for me, Bob. I'd like to help that young man. Help him? How? Send him to college. College? <laughs> Bob, I believe you've gone mad. But don't worry. I'm your friend. <laughs> I'll keep your secret. And so it went. The free and easy conversation. They disagreed on everything, but never lost their tempers. Never came to blows. What a wonderful way to be able to talk and... How wonderful also to have things to talk about. Would I ever be able to talk like they did? Would I ever have anyone to talk to? Jim? Yes, sir? What are you doing? I'm supposed to cut wood for the fire. Why do you say that, Jim? Because Master say chop and I'm supposed... I know you were ordered to do it, but you could just as easily say... I was supposed to cut wood for the fire. Well, Jim? Yes, yeah, sir. How did you learn to read? You can read, can't you, Jim? I... Uh, don't be afraid of me. The colonel has an excellent library. I know. I selected it for him. However, he has neither the time nor the inclination to read. But I know someone has been reading those books, Jim. Who? You? Yes, sir. I was right. I sensed it. There is something uh, about the transference of thought. I knew you could read. Don't ask me how. It has to be miraculous. Who taught you to read? No one. Then how did you learn? It came to me. The books bound in bright red, in rich brown leather. Something, I don't know what, drew me to the books. Something seemed to say to me, Come, Jim. Come to the books. What was it, a voice? No. It was a desire. But the markings in the books were so mysterious, so hidden. Will they always be kept from me, I asked. And then I, I saw a picture of a pistol. And there was the marking under it. And it was suddenly revealed to me, this must be the marking... This must be the sign that signifies a pistol. Then I understood. There is a sign, a word for everything. Jim, that's remarkable. Is it? It's amazing. What a fantastic accomplishment. You should be so happy. Why? Because you've achieved such a tremendous victory. Have I? Or have I become a whale? Yes, I, I have listened to what you said about whales. What good does my learning bring me? Like the whale, I can only flounder aimlessly and endlessly, to no purpose. What can I do? Where can I go? Jim, Jim, you come with me right now. But Master says I'm supposed to chop wood. I want to see the look on Ben Border's face. You drop that axe and come with me. <laughs> Once upon a time... The deep red berries of the mulberry tree were as white as snow. The change in color came about strangely and sadly. The death of two young lovers was the cause. Pyramus and Thisbe lived in Babylon, the city of Queen Semiramis. Well, I'll be. Now open another book, Jim. To any page. The Theorem of Pythagoras. It's a trick. Open this book, Jim. Sweet are the uses of adversity which, like the toad, ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious jewel in his head. I still say it's a trick. That book, Jim. All right, all right. Now, now Bob, how are you doing this? Doing what? I seen in a theater once a fellow was able to throw his voice and make you think that uh, someone else was speaking. Oh, admit that you were wrong, Ben. About what? About a great many things. I still say it's some kind of trick. What are we going to do about Jim? 
Do, Bob. A man with his brain. Can you force him to live out his life as a beast of burden? Well, hang it, Bob. What am I supposed to do? Sell him to me. You mean you? <laughs> a true blue dot and a wool northern abolitionist like you? You don't a slave? <laughs> this is the time of great happening. I want <laughs> to buy him so I can take him north and set him free. Well, I ain't going to let you go puffing and preening among your northern friends at the heart of the goodness of your heart. You spent $800 to give a poor black soul his freedom. You mean you won't sell him? No, I won't sell him. Why not? Because I'm an honest man. He ain't worth a nickel. His value has just gone all the way down to absolute zero. What are you talking about? His head so full of uh, pyramids and Thisbe and Pythagoras and I don't know who and what all. How's he going to chop cotton, a whole corn, or wait on table? Take him, take him for what he's worth now. Nothing. <laughs> I could hardly believe it. It was like a story in the Bible. And it came to pass, and now it had come to pass for me. I was to go north to freedom. Freedom. Soon, that great day finally dawned, when I could leave the farm and slavery forever. And I hitched the horses to the carriage as I had done so many times before, but this time, I was going to ride in it too. And we started out for Santa Lucia, a small port on the Gulf of Mexico, where we could take a boat to New Orleans, and from thence to St. Louis, and Cincinnati, and Pittsburgh, and Philadelphia, and New York, and finally Boston. Those names, those great ringing names. Is it much farther to Santa Lucia, Ben? Oh, about two hours. Well, I guess this is goodbye. Goodbye forever. Oh, I don't know, Ben. We could still... Oh, it's a long, long trip. And we're neither of us grown younger. No, we're not. I'm glad our friendship lasted, Bob. Despite everything, we remain friends. Good friends. That's why I gave you Jim. So remember me, Bob. Uh, ben, what's that? That cloud of dust oh. moving very quickly toward us. Well, it's men. They're on horses. Who are they, soldiers? No. No, uh, I'm afraid they look like bandits. Bandits? Yeah, the country's full. I didn't think they'd come so close to St. Lucia. Well, what are we going to do? There's not much we can do, Bob. We can't outrun them. We can't outfight them. All we can do is wait. Oh, oh! And we waited. And as we stood there motionless and watched the cloud of dust grow larger and heard the approaching thunder of horses' hooves, something bright and happy inside of me suddenly became dark and sad. I knew I wasn't going to be free. I wasn't going to Boston with Mr. Darcy because Mr. Darcy had a gray look in his face, the look that people get just before they die. They used to say a man who was about to die had a certain look on his face. It was supposed to be the soul getting ready to leave the body. The soul waiting for the moment of release. Is Mr. Darcy going to die? Why? How? And if he does, what will happen to Jim? Well, nothing will happen to anyone until I return in a few moments with Act Two. Texas, long before Texas was a state in our union, even before Texas was an independent republic, we're in the Texas that was still part of Mexico, a vast, wild country into which poured thousands of American settlers. And some of the wildness of this raw-boned country is about to erupt. Who are they, Ben? Oh, I recognize them now. It's Zalakane and his boys. Let me do all the talk. They only want money, so just do as you're told. El Tor! Well, Senor Salakane, 
What can I do for you? I am not Senor Zalakane. I am now General Zalakane. Well, congratulations. Yes, we are revolutionists. We will overthrow the government one day. And so we would like you to contribute to the revolution. <laughs> well, do I have a choice, you bloody scoundrel? <laughs> if you weren't such an old friend, I would cut your heart out. All your money into the hat. And your senor. Empty your pockets, Bob. And the watch. The watch? Si, senor. The watch. But the, the watch, it, it would have very little value to you, and it has a great deal of sentimental value to me. The watch? Uh, sir, let me explain. Bob, don't argue with him. Give him the watch. But then Lisa gave me this before she died. The watch? Let me explain to you, sir, why I did The watch? No, no I... Oh! Why, you bloodthirsty animal! Oh! Oh! It took a second. But my dream was shattered and in ruins. Mr. Darcy was dead. Colonel Borders was lying on the ground unconscious with a bullet wound. Somehow I, I managed to get them both into the wagon and I turned the team around and drove slowly home. Home. I had dared to dream of becoming an eagle. But in reality I was still a whale. Several months went by, and, and finally, Colonel Borders recovered from his wound. But he wasn't the same. Something seemed to have left him. He never mentioned Mr. Darcy's name on, until one morning. Well, Jim. Yes, sir? Where'd they bury Mr. Darcy? In Santa Lucia. Jim, what did Mr. Darcy do to you? Do to me, sir? Yeah, Jim. How, how did he get you to read through all of the books? Well, what was the trick? Oh, it was no trick. Oh, I'll bet he... I'll bet he hypnotized you. No, sir. <laughs> I bet you don't even know what it all means. I have read the monograph published by F.A. Mesmer, who... Well, uh, that's enough, that's enough. Colonel, please... You promised, Mr. Darcy, you'd set me free. I promised no such thing. I promised to sell you to him for nothing. Well, that's the same thing. Well, he was my best friend. My only friend. He'd want you to be free, and I... I'll see that you do go free, but, but not now. I, I can't do it now. Why? Why? You question me, you dare question me. I'll give you your answer with a horse whip. I... Jim. Jim, is it true? Is, is what true? Is it true you can read and write? Yes. Then you got to help me. Now, o open up that chest with, with my papers in it. That's it. Now, now you're going to have to, you're going to have to take care of all that. Because I, I... I can't seem to concentrate. The words, numbers, they, they, they just dance on the paper. You've got to help me, Jim. You've got to help me. It was the first time a white man had ever asked me to do something. I knew what it was to be told. But to be asked, that was something else. Something strange. And, and, and knew. I kept his records. I wrote his letters. And every day he became richer and richer. And every day I would ask him the same question. Colonel, when will you give me my freedom? Freedom? You promised me. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it's my intention to give you your freedom. It's just that the, the time ain't ripe. You, you need it here. But... Colonel, I... Oh, Jim, you're getting treated right. Yes. All you want to eat, well... Yes. Nice clothes. You live here in the house, you got a comfortable bed, and linen, just like me. <laughs> you know, Jim, you must be the only black slave in the world who sleeps with bed sheets. But, Colonel, I... Now, that's something, Jim. That's something. The days went by, and I was getting no closer to freedom. The Colonel was thriving. 
With me to keep his records and watch his money, he was becoming wealthier by the month, and I still kept asking. All right, Jim. I'm going to call your bluff. Bluff? What do you have if I set you free? Well, I... I'll have my freedom. Well, free to do what? Starve? No, no, I... I don't know. How'll you get there? I... I can work my way. <laughs> You'll be kidnapped by bounty hunters. I'll have my paper. They'll laugh in your face and tear them up. They'll sell you as a runaway slave. And some Louisiana or Mississippi cotton planter will work you to death in his fields. <laughs> well, you still want to be free? For the very first time, I felt fear crawling through me. What was this? Was I afraid? Afraid to be free? Well, maybe it wasn't fear. Yeah, there were some very real advantages to, to my present condition. I, he was right. I had enough to eat, a, a, a comfortable home and the work. It, it wasn't at all difficult, and there, there was a wonderful collection of books. And, and so I thought of the North and freedom. And it suddenly seemed so far away. And then I heard that sound. And to a slave, it's the most frightening and melancholy sound in the world. It was a coffle, a gang of slaves being marched along the road, an endless caravan which grows larger and smaller as some are bought, some are sold along the winding road of slavery that snakes through the south. I looked at the faces, the dull, staring eyes. The hopelessness, the resignation, and, of course, the ugly red welts of the whip. Well, Colonel, how are things this year? Oh, can't really complain, Mr. McClure. Got some prize merchandise here? No, not this time. Anything you want to sell? Mm, nothing, really. Nothing at all? <laughs> Tell me, Mr. McClure, what's the going rate for a slave who can read and write? <laughs> You'd have to pay me to take him. <laughs> Got any good field hands? No, none to spare. Soon they'll be worth their weight in gold. Well, Colonel, see you next time around. Looper, Tom, get him going. Everybody up. Let's go, let's go, move out. Well, there, Jim, but for the grace, go you. All it would take to make it happen would be for you to be kidnapped by an unscrupulous bounty hunter. And there are plenty of those. Well... But I'm not free. Who's free? What's this freedom you talk about so much? It's the freedom to starve and to freeze. Jim, you just don't know how lucky you are. Maybe I didn't. It was the very first time that kind of thought had ever stolen inside my head. We keep talking about being free. But if we were, where would we go? What could we do? What kind of work would I find to do? Freedom. It had always been a word that thrilled me. And now it frightened me. But one day, something frightened me even more. Jim. Yes, sir? You didn't give Mr. Darcy any meat. Mr. Darcy? Don't stand there looking like that. Colonel, Mr. Darcy isn't here. Who are you saying, Jim? Ain't that Mr. Darcy sitting at the table big as life? Colonel, Mr. Darcy's dead. You, you lost your mind. What little bit of mind you ever had. You lost your mind. Jim. What, what am I doing here in bed? You... You're sick, Colonel. You fainted. I feel hot and dizzy. I can't move my whole right side. Jim, well, what's the matter with me? You... Well, I, I looked it up in the book. You, you have what they call a stroke. What? Something something happens to the blood. It, it doesn't flow freely. Freely? Freely? What, 
What happens? Well, sometimes you get better. And sometimes you, you don't. Jim, ri- right into Santa Lucia. Bring back the doctor. Colonel, the doctor can't help you. He's got to help me. He's a doctor. I read in the books that there's nothing anyone can do. Oh, what do you know about it? I've read as much as any doctor, and I tell you... Now, Jim, you go get me that doctor. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll sign the paper. Paper that sets you free. No, how's that, huh? Here, b- b- bring in some paper and a pen and, and ink. And while you're gone, I'll, I'll write the, the document. Now, you, you, you hurry, Jim. You hurry. I galloped all the way to Santa Lucia and all the way back with the doctor. But we returned too late. He was dead. The colonel had died. And there was a sheet of paper clutched in his hand. But it was blank. Not a single word had been written in it. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're now selling the estate of our dearly beloved and recently departed friend, Colonel Benjamin Borders. And to begin with, we got us as prime a stock of living merchandise as there is in the entire state. I begin with Jim here. How old are you, boy? <laughs> Cat's got his tongue. <laughs> but he's a well-trained hard worker. Use him in the house, in the field. Look at them muscles. Now, will somebody open the bidding at $400? $750. Well, it's Mr. McClure. Yes, sir, it is. Ain't got time to waste with nickel and dimes bidding. I know what it's worth and what I can get, and I'm a busy man. I got seven fifty. Do I hear another bid? Another bid. Well, then, you got yourself a bargain there, Mr. McClure. Come on, boy. Just down the road, I could see them. The coffle. The poor, wretched, terrified slaves in the coffle. In a few moments, I would be one of them. Yes, I had always been a slave from the moment of my birth. But this would be a kind of slavery I had never known before. This would be the naked and violent slavery I had dreamed of in my nightmares. And suddenly, I was no longer afraid of freedom. The colonel's horse, Jupiter, was standing nearby. Another piece of flesh, like me, waiting to be sold to the highest bidder. But a superb piece of flesh, the fastest in the county. Before anyone could realize what was taking place, I was on his back. Run, Jupiter, run! Run like you never ran before! You're running for freedom! Freedom, the magic word. But where is there to run to? The north, the friendly north, is so many thousands of miles away. And all around is dangerous country and even more dangerous men. Freedom, it's a long way off. But the longest journey always starts with the very first determined step. I shall return shortly with Act Three. extremely complex young man. His name is Jim. That's all. Just Jim. Black slaves had no family names. Actually, they had no family. In reality, they were nobody. They were nobody until they called attention to themselves. And they could only do that by breaking the established pattern of their lives. And Jim is doing that right now. He has just escaped. I see nobody caught him, Sheriff. Mr. McClure, he does have the fastest horse in all of Texas. He's my property. I paid for him. I expect you to return him to me. Oh, we'll get him. Why ain't you organizing a posse to ride him down? Why, now, be reasonable, Mr. McClure. I'm going to deputize a few good trackers, and they'll manage to come up I with I want them. action. I'm entitled to the protection of the law. I've never seen a finer piece of flesh in all the years I've doing business. I gotta get him back. Freedom. This was freedom. This terrible wilderness where nothing could live. Where the cruel sun prowled the body by day and the cold, lifeless moon froze the blood at night. 
The food. The water. And one morning, Jupiter disappeared. I, I, I don't know. I, I awoke and my horse was gone. And, and I knew that I was gone too. I was too weak to walk or even to worry. I, so I, I lay on the ground to wait. To wait for freedom. And suddenly, she was there. Sitting on her horse. A woman, a white woman, pointing a rifle at me. And two men, black like me, slaves like me, were with her. Who are you, boy? What are you doing here? Where are you bound for? Freedom. Freedom. What was that? What are you saying? Let me dwell in freedom's house. You look like a runaway to me. Mose, Henry... Get him up on his feet. We'll take him home and find out who he belongs to. Let me dwell in Freedom's house and let them call me Freedom's child. All right now, that'll be enough of that. Solitudinem, fecant, pacem, apelant. They make a desert and call it peace, but there is no peace. No peace in the desert. All right, you're crazy. But you're smart enough to eat. I see you cleaned up that plate. I, I kept the books. I, I did the accounts. I, I, I wrote the letters. I, I paid the bills. You're crazy in the head from the sun. Let me keep your books, ma'am. What are you saying? Let me teach your children. Latin and grammar and, 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 and algebra. Oh, I, I, I don't want him to catch me. He'll hunt me down. Who? Who's going to hunt you down? He has a whip. He holds a whip in one hand and a chain in the other. Save me. Save me from him. I'll make you rich, rich. There was a broiling sun and a freezing moon and a black whale drowning in a sea of desert sand. And then, and then the sun set and the moon went down and the black whale suddenly became a black man. And he was lying on a pile of straw in a small, dark hut. And a white woman was standing there, looking down at him. Well, boy, you look a lot better. Yes, and... You sound a lot better, too. Where'd you learn how to talk like... like a Yankee gentleman? Please, Missy, I, I don't mean no harm. Yes, Henry? What do you want? Miss Jenny, ma'am, a gentleman to see you up to the house. To see me? What about? It's Mr. McClure, ma'am. Oh, Mr. McClure. So you're running away from Mr. McClure. Yes, ma'am. I knew he was a runaway. I knew it. Please, ma'am, don't. Don't give me up to Mr. McClure. And why shouldn't I? Please. Please, I'll die. Hide me. I'm not just an ordinary field hand. I'll, I'll work for you the way I did for Colonel Borders. Don't turn me over to Mr. McClure. Did Mr. McClure pay for you? Well? Yes, ma'am. Then he's your master. And it's my duty as a law-abiding woman, as a religious woman, to return you to your legal, rightful owner. You call yourself a law-abiding religious woman? But what laws do you follow? What religion do you obey? Who gives you the right to treat me like an animal? Look at me. Look at me. You ignorant, arrogant woman. I'm a man. I'm a man like your husband, like your father, like your son. I have the same heart, the same blood, the same soul. Henry, shut his mouth. And as much as you have done it to the least of my brethren, you have done it unto me. I said shut his blast from his mouth. <laughs> Henry, don't you dare let him leave this hut. Henry? No, no, I... I knows what you're going to ask me. Just do that, so... I, I, I've got to escape. Oh, Miss Jenny, scare me alive. You'll kill me. Mr. McClure, kill me. Well, you, you better off, Dade. We're all better off, Dade. No. We're better off free. Don't you worry not about it, boy. You'll be free soon enough. Oh, oh Mr. McClure... Morning, Miss Thompson. Gotta run down a young buck. Lost him about a week ago. Kind of tall. No fat on him, but good muscles. 
trailed him up into this vicinity. Was wondering if you might have seen him. I ran away? I... No. I haven't heard anything. Well, I'm much obliged to you, Miss Thompson. I... I hope you find him. Oh, I'll find him. If I have to spend every penny I got in the rest of my life, I'll find him. I ought to have you hanged. Better burned as a witch. Why do you say that, ma'am? Why? Because you bewitched me. You have a strange power. Somehow, you prevented me from telling Mr. McClure you're here on my property. What did you do to me? I did nothing. I was ready to tell him you were being kept here. And and the words refused to come out. You cast a spell on me. No. You say you're a law-abiding woman. A religious woman. And I've been one all my life until today. That's why you saved me from slavery. It's true. Something said to you, save him. Deliver him from slavery. Oh. Whatever. However. That's what I've done. Well. Now you're free. Get going. What did you say? You're free. Go. Go? Where? Go to your freedom. Well, go on, get. No, no, don't, don't, don't make me go out there. Not into that desert. You want to be free, don't you? Let me, let me stay here with you. I, I'll make you rich. Oh, shut up. Henry, he can still help you in the fields. We'll keep him. Please believe me, ma'am. Get him another shirt and a hat and set him to plowing. Yes, sir, Miss Jenny, ma'am. And you mind Henry now. What's your name? Jim. Is you saying the truth, Jim? Can you read and write? Do you know all them other things? Yes. It's the truth. Then go away. Go away from here. What are you talking about? You gotta go to freedom. Freedom? What do you know about it? Uh, I know it's one thing. You free now. Yeah, free. You ain't in the dark like all the rest of us. You read, you write, you can make things. You can talk. You can't stay here, die here for nothing. I don't want to go. I'm, I'm afraid. And what good are you? Go, be somebody, get. No, n- not now. Mr. McClure's out there. Mr. McClure always be out there. Look, I'll... I'll get a bag with meat and bread and water and a horse. Come with me, Henry. No, no. I, I'm free. Not yet. Maybe never. But you. You get. I, I need more than food and, and water and a horse for my freedom, Henry. I'll need that rifle. <laughs> It was a wild, arid wilderness. And I didn't know where it ended, but I knew that I must keep going north. I was no longer running to freedom. I had freedom. I was a free man seeking a free people. I was busy with my thoughts, so I didn't see him there waiting. Sitting on his horse with the gun in his hand until I was almost upon him. All right, boy. Walk that horse because I'm going to whip you to within one half inch of your life. You're not going to whip anybody. Get off the horse? No. No? I warn you, don't you reach for that rifle, boy. You hear me? I heard you. I can pull this trigger before you can even level that gun. You can, but you won't. Don't try me. What good am I to you, dead? Take your hands off that rifle. I'll blow your head off. You won't blow the head off of $750. Drop your rifle. You better shoot me now. Quick. Well, you still have the chance. You can't do it. You just can't believe I dare to kill you. And you won't. You know you'll be hunted down like an animal. But I am an animal. You can't believe what you're seeing. A black man who dares to point a gun at you. Ah, you ain't stupid. You know you can't get away. But it has to begin. Somewhere. Sometime. With somebody. Just put the gun away. You're only making it worse. No. Get off that horse. Move aside. Oh, <laughs> Goodbye to you, Mr. McClure. 
It had to begin somewhere, sometime, with somebody. And where Jim went, and whether or not he survived the hardships and the dangers of the wilderness, must remain a mystery. And we tell this story during these times when our minds are concerned with the birth of freedom in our country to take the measure of how far we have come and perhaps to consider how far we have yet to go. I shall be back in a few moments. Teledisc proudly presents the Classical Collection. The Classical Collection. Three hours of the world's best loved music. Beethoven, Mozart, Tchaikovsky, Chopin. An exquisite four-album library, the classical collection comes wrapped in its own gift box with a special program guide only from Teledisc and not in any store. To order, call 1-800-642-7400. The classical collection, your musical treasure for years to come. Call 1-800-642-7400. Operators are standing by. Credit cards accepted and satisfaction is guaranteed or your money back. Call 1-800-642-7400 to order your copy of the Classical Collection today. Hello, I'm Victor Kayam. Hospital patients are benefiting from Remington's advanced shaving technology with the 3M Surgical Clipper by Remington. It shaves patients safely and comfortably prior to surgery. You can benefit from Remington's advanced technology at home with the Remington Microscreen. It has two thin, flexible screens to shave you incredibly close. The Remington Microscreen shaves as close as a blade or your money back. No other electric shaver makes that promise. the prisoner of the sea. But how many millions of whales there must be in our midst, in our own world? For there are other cruel seas that act as a prison. Ignorance is a sea, and poverty is a sea, and superstition is a sea, and hatred is a sea. And until a way is found for all men to emerge from these cruel seas, all of us are in danger of drowning. Our cast included Brock Peters, Brett Morrison, Lynn Hamilton, Marvin Miller, and Ken Lynch. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. When you give blood, you give another birthday party, another wedding anniversary, another day at the beach, another walk across a field. When you give blood, you give another holiday with the family, another drive after supper, another talk with a friend, another laugh, another cry, another hug, another chance. This is David Steinberg for the American Red Cross. Please give blood. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.